Welcome. Welcome. He is also the, he's also the senior vice president of West Gulf Maritime Association. So we'll have to have him come speak sometime about his career as well. So we want to welcome you all here, and I'm going to tell you a little bit more about the museum at the end of the presentation, but right now I want to make sure we have plenty of opportunity to hear from our two wonderful speakers tonight. We're going to hear about, first, from Scott Wordle, who's with Clarkson's, about a very unique career in ship brokering, and I'm very excited to learn about that, and I know very little about it as well. So with, I'm going to let him tell you more about himself, how he got into ship brokering, and what he does. And I'm looking so forward to hearing him. So just know that there is food out there. You're welcome to bring food in here. And we look so forward to hearing you, hearing from Scott. And then you can also ask questions at the end of his presentation. And then we'll have Maria Burns come up and speak to you about she has such a varied career history. So we're looking forward to hearing about ship broker from her, but also the many other things that Maria has done. So welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, excuse me. I'm so sorry. I forgot one thing. If I could just pass this around, if you would please sign in for us and please include your email address. That way you'll be able to find out about the other upcoming lectures and also about the other events we have going on at the museum. Thank you so much. Even if you've already signed in before, please do so and if not, we'd like to keep up with who comes to each one of our events. We appreciate it tremendously. Thank you. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you for having us and uh, been walking around the museum and it's a, it's a fantastic place. So take some time and, and look at some of these uh, models and such. It's, it, it's really impressive. So thanks for having me. Can everybody hear me okay? I, I hope so. Um, as you mentioned, my name is Scott Bertle. I'm the Managing Director of uh, Specialized Products in Houston. It's not spelled wrong. We're a European company, so uh, they spell things a little bit differently. And uh, I'm just here to talk, uh, introduce my company, introduce myself, talk a little bit about how I got to where I am, what ship brokers do, and maybe opportunities uh, out in the maritime field. Um, going forward. So again, my name is Scott Bertle. We'll talk a little bit about my how I got to where I'm at. I'm from a small town in, uh, in Pennsylvania, from Wimber, PA. It's about 50 miles southeast of Pittsburgh, the higher Steelers fan. Um, the only thing famous there is Tarzan, the real Tarzan. I was born there. Uh, <laughs> I joined the Marine Corps in 1993, right out of high school. I served six years in the United States Marine Corps. I earned the rank of sergeant. In 1995, I got stationed at INI duty in Galveston to train reservists and do public affairs work after I did a tour in Bosnia. Um, when I got there, there was only 11 active duty Marines, so it was very diff different than um, being in Bosnia or being in the Fleet Marine Corps. It was like a seven to four job, except on the weekends when I was training the reservists. And then public affairs, we did, you know, Toys for Tots, or you see the Marines out there in the parades. We did notifications, we did funerals, those type of things. And <clears throat> I started, uh, I played basketball, I was playing rugby, because I played rugby in the Marine Corps. I played rugby down in Galveston and uh, met one of the ROTC officers from Texas A&M, and he says, listen, you need to uh, go to school. So I started night school um, at A&M Galveston, and, you know, taking a couple hours here and there, and <laughs> Finally, I took all my Englishes and my maths and histories, and they said, you need to declare a major. <clears throat> said, uh, what do you want to do? I said, yeah, I want to be a stockbroker. I want to you know, do all this. I said, we don't have any of that here. <laughs> the, the closest thing we have is a uh, maritime administration. I said, OK, I'll give that a shot. <clears throat> One of the classes was brokerage and chartering. And, uh, I was, I, I was just fascinated, right? I mean, being from Wimber, Pennsylvania, we're steel mill people and coal miners. You know, my dad was a steel worker, coal miner, truck driver. I knew about ships. I knew they're out there in the water. But no idea, right? Um, so, man, I, I, this is something I think I'd really like to do. So, 1999, when it was time to uh, get out of the Marine Corps, um, I could get out, or I had orders to Paris Island, South Carolina, be a drill instructor. So that ain't happening. So uh, <laughs> I, I got out and finished my degree. Got a Bachelor of Science in Maritime Administration from Texas A&M in 2001. Knowing that I wanted to try to be a broker, I targeted the ship brokerage firms in Houston. And I went after all of them and sent out my resumes. And here I am. Please hire me. 
um, and finally was hired by a small company called Atlas Maritime, and they promoted this training program. They said, okay, we're going to put you three months in the gas industry, and three months in the chemicals, and three months in operations, accounting, all this kind of stuff. And I thought, okay, there, here's my chance. I'm going to learn a little bit about everything. May not be getting paid like some of my friends, but, you know, I'm going to learn. And in about six to eight weeks, the broker there resigned. And my boss was like, dude, you better figure it out quick. And there, there it was. Um, I left Atlas in 2003 to join Clarkson's. They opened up their office here in the U.S. It, they had four people at the time. I was the fifth guy they hired. And now we have over 70 people in the U.S. And we're, and we're still growing. <clears throat> at that time, I also started my MBA at the University of Houston with a focus on international business. I graduated with my MBA in 2005. I continued working to grow our portfolio at Clarkson's. I'm now the managing director of our specialized products group. And it's exciting because every day is an opportunity to create something that wasn't available yesterday. You know, we're not going into work and, you know, loading the trucks and having 50 pallets to load them at the end of the day, you know, that I get the 50 pallets in or whatever. I mean, we're trying to figure out the market, see what we can do, come up with better ideas in order to make our clients money so at the end of the day we can make money. That's the name of our game. We, we just want to make money. So our agenda is I'm going to introduce you to our company and specialized products, talk a little bit about the career path, my day as a broker and some of our hiring practices, review outlook and questions, and hopefully it's not boring enough to put you to sleep like Mickey Mouse there. <laughs> um, so what is a ship broker? It's one who transacts business between the owners of vessels and the merchants who send cargo. <coughs> so specialized products is basically petrochemicals. That's what we call specialized products in the rest of the world. Here, most people know them as chemicals. <coughs> chemicals are used in everything we have, basically. And so there's comes from the coal, natural gas, and oil. And there's all kinds of derivatives like the benzene, the xylene, the toluene. We have gas as ethylene and propylene. And these are the raw materials to make all kinds of stuff. I'm sorry you can't see this, but you know, for example, like the toluene will go into gasoline to help, you know, do octenes and such like that. The xylenes go in to make plastics. And so they make the plastic pellets. Paraxylene goes in and it makes plastic pellets which are like little BBs of plastic, and then they're melted down into making phones and TVs and all that kind of stuff. We have styrene monomer that comes out of the benzene derivatives, and then you know what styrene is. I mean, you've got the styrene coolers, you've got the styrene basically foam that goes in between for insulation and stuff like that. All that stuff starts with the raw materials which we're shipping on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and there's plants all over the world that make these different products. And so for the chemicals, what I specialize in, we have arbitrage opportunities. So it all depends. One plant may go down, so all of a sudden the price goes up in this country, so we need to ship it from the U.S. or vice versa. So these things are shipping back and forth and all kinds of stuff. Where crude oil mainly comes out of the Middle East. So it's very much more um, study. It's uh, easy to track. You know that there's going to be 58 cargoes coming out from Sabek in the Middle East, so how many ships are there? And you can really do a supply-demand analysis and see, okay, you know, there's only 50 ships there. That market's going up in June. In the chemical division, we can have a plant explosion, and, you know, we could be shipping xylenes out to Asia, and as soon as it gets to Asia, we turn it around and send it right back to the U.S. Brokers love that because we get paid on commission, so <laughs> ship it back and forth, we're all good for that. So it just gives you an idea that you know what we're shipping on a raw material basis, petrochemicals, it's in everything you do, and you know we, we, we try to ship it. <clears throat> Clarkson's, we have um, 20 offices worldwide. We do everything uh, basically that goes on the water. Uh, we broker crude oil, CPP, which is jet fuel and, and gasoline, specialized products. We do containers, dry cargo, like wheat, grain, scrap metal, uh, cars, you know, all those type of things. If you need, you know, Carnival Cruise Lines when the hurricane came, you know, we, we time chartered some of those ships in so people could stay on the vessels. You know, we were involved in that kind of stuff. 
And you can see where we're much more active in like Europe and Asia and such, and our office is here in, in Houston, and we have a capital markets financial services office in New York. We believe we have a competitive advantage over our competitors because we're involved in so many different things. We're the oldest ship broker in the world. We're publicly traded on the London Stock Exchange. You can buy stock in Clarkson's. Um, and I wanted to show this slide because shipping is not just ship brokering or loading ships or birthing ships, right? So specialized products is for chemicals. We have gas, we have pet chem gas, LNG. We have short sea, which people are specialized in all these different markets. So I specialize in chemicals, but we have whole divisions in specializing containers offshore. You know, you're building these oil rigs that you see here. Um, sale and purchase, you buy and sell ships. You know, I mean, ExxonMobil needs 10 new ships to handle their plant out in the Middle East. We'll help them buy those ships. Um, and there's, you have to specialize. You have to know what's going on in the market. Every day is dynamic. So I can't specialize in all of this stuff. I'll get beat. Um, we have obviously legal services. We need lawyers because <clears throat> what you think is right in the maritime setting is not legally right sometimes in the maritime setting. So I'm always on the phone with our legal services. We have analysts, we have research services, we have freight derivatives trading, capital markets, financial services. You know, so if someone wants to build this oil rig and they can't come up with you know, $500 million, we have a division that can go to Wall Street, work with these bankers and come up with that money. And so now all of a sudden, you know, we're getting the deal done, we're building the oil rig, we're getting commission on the financial part of it, now all of a sudden we're getting three and four sets of commissions on hundreds of millions of dollars. Man, when you're doing that, it gets pretty fun. So I just wanted to let you know, this is what we do, this is why we think we have a competitive advantage, and these are just some different divisions that you can look into to forward your career and, and do something. So very quickly, our specialized office, specialized products, global offices, uh, Houston, we have our Houston office. London is our mothership. <clears throat> we have Geneva because uh, Geneva is growing significantly on the trading group uh, because their taxes are a little bit lower. I mean, we complain about taxes here, but it's nothing compared to Europe. And so a lot of these European companies are moving into uh, Geneva in order to take advantage of the earnings and lower the tax bills. Um, Oslo, shipping basically started in Norway. So, you know, we've got to have an office in Norway. Uh, Hamburg, uh, big German companies there, uh, particularly like BASF and such, they're huge companies, so we have offices there to handle that. Dubai, the Middle East is an enormous, enormous center for chemical growth, and so we have offices there. And then of course Singapore servicing the Asia Pacific region. Uh, what we try to do is we, we try to have a vast amount of experience, right? So about 25% of our staff has zero to five years of experience. We need these young guys to basically come up with ideas, fresh perspectives. Um, six to 10 years, you know, these guys have the energy, the knowledge, they can go get it. Um, 11 to 15 years, 10% with good experience and they know what's going on. And then 40% of our brokers have 15 years or more experience. Um, that's important because you know, the guys in the zero to five years are just, they're knocking it every day, man. They're in early, out late, working their butts off, traveling, doing everything. You know, you get tired doing that. So, you know, your energy levels will start, you'll start to see, you know. I'm the senior guy on our desk and I'm in my, well, 30s. So, <laughs> so you know, but, you know, most of the crew is, is, is much younger, so it's, it's, we believe we have a best-in-class personnel because of that. So let's go back and talk a little bit, again, the ship broker, just one who transacts business between the owners of the vessels and the merchants who send the cargoes. So a charter is someone who has the cargo, and I'm sure you know some of these companies, ExxonMobil, Dow, ConocoPhillips, Chevron Phillips, but there's thousands of companies that have chemicals, right? ADM with the vegetable oils, they go, vegetable oil, they go in our salads and stuff like that. 
VTOL, believe it or not, VTOL is one of the largest trading companies in the world. They, sh they fix more ships than Exxon, right? But they're, they're trading, taking advantage of uh, arbitrage opportunities. Bungie is another enormous vegetable oil, corn oil, soybean oil type of company. We do products for them. Mitsubishi Chemical. You know, Mitsubishi, they own everything in Japan. They have banks, they have cars, they have air conditioners, they have, you name it, Mitsubishi copy probably, right? So these are some of the guys that we do business with. And you can see there's names that you would never really think, or you probably would have never heard of. All these companies have different divisions moving different products and need expertise to help them in shipping. And so we would talk to their chartering personnel to what we call fix their ships, which means we secure the deal with ship owners. And so ship owners are the guys who own the ships. Um, so you might hear in the chemical industry, people like Stolt Tankers or Odco Tankers, Tokyo Marine, BLT Kenball, MTM, MISC, Joe Tankers, Aurora Tankers, Marine, and when someone like BP or Exxon, they have cargo, they'll call someone like us and expect us to know what the market's doing, where the ships are, how much the freight rates are, how far out they need to book the ships, how far out they need to talk about it, because you don't want your competition knowing what you're doing, so those type of things. And we would work with these owners to get part space on their ships and send it from point A to point B. It's like being a travel agent. You want to fly from Houston to New York, you call United, you see what seats they have open, how much it is, maybe they're more expensive than Southwest, you call Southwest, do you have a seat on my days, is it cheaper? It's the same thing here. Do you have a tank on the ship? I want to go to Olsen, or I want to go Rotterdam to Turkey. You know, how many tanks do you have? What's the market rate? I can get it cheaper here. You negotiate out those terms. You put a deal on subjects. It's subject to approvals by everybody. And then uh, hopefully we fix it. We lift the subjects. We make our money. So that's, that's what we do. So there's different types of tankers. <clears throat> we distinguish them between the size, the tank pumps, lines of the ship that we're constructing, and specifically for the type of liquid cargo that we carry. So there are crude oil tankers, there's product tankers, there's gas tankers. And when I talk about gas, I'm not talking about gas and BP, we're talking about liquid gas. Um, then we have chemical tankers, which again, I'm in every day. And they're differentiated by their tank coating. There's basically four different types of tanks. It's stainless steel, which are the best, it's the easiest to clean, but it's also the most expensive. Um, you've got coated vessels, which is a, called epoxy coating, uh, like a coffee mug. If you ever have your coffee mugs, that kind of feels like an epoxy coating. We have zinc, it's a little bit rough, um, but it carries specific cargoes because it doesn't contaminate it. And there's a new type of coating that came out called marine line coating. It's a, hybrid between a stainless steel and an epoxy coated. Um, it's supposed to be a, a cheaper type of coating that can carry some of the stainless steel products. So the, the ships are not as expensive, but they're supposed to do the same as a stainless steel tanker. That verdict is still out a little bit. A lot of those are Chinese built. The Chinese yards having some difficulties there, but they're coming. Number of segregations, basically how many seats you got on a plane, right? How many tanks you got on a ship. That would be the segregations. And the IMO classification, basically on chemical tankers, they classify the cargoes in different IMO classes. And so the least volatile cargo would be like an IMO 3, and then more volatile would be IMO 2, and then the most volatile would be IMO 1. In order to get those classifications, you need to have a crew that's certified. The ships have to be certified. <clears throat> you got to have the proper certificates and all that kind of thing in order to carry those cargoes. So those are the type of tankers that the owners would have. So today's modern size tankers, we have um, VLCCs, which are very large crew carriers, uh, Suez Max, uh, Aframaxes, LR2s, which are long range two, Panamax, LR1, which is long range one, MR, which is medium range, handy tankers, and small tankers. 
The average size of a VLCC is, you know, 3,000 dead weight. They're quite significant vessels. I don't even think they can come into Houston. They have to go to the loop because they, they just don't fit. And so you'll bring in a VLCC and you'll do some Anamaxes or Aframaxes, and you'll lighter the cargoes off of them and bring them in from there. Um, so you can see the difference between the VLCCs and the small and handies that I deal with. Um, and those are the type of modern tankers out there. You want to get in shipping and you want to deal with ships, you should have an idea what a ship looks like and you should uh, just take a look and, and see, look at the model. Where, where's a pump room? What's a, what's a propeller? What's a rudder? What's a derrick, which is like the crane? Um, crossover lines, a mass, the radio antennas, the, the bulbous ball, the mooring winches. Um, these are all type of things that you're going to see on these tankers. And just, you should just get familiar with them. So I put a picture up of a tanker and I label it a little bit just so people have an idea that there's different layers and there's different stuff on ships that you should kind of have an idea what it is if you're going to get into, into shipping. <clears throat> so as I discussed, there's multiple trade lanes that we have that carry all the products I had the chart up there on the petrochemicals. And so these are all the trade lanes that we deal in, in every, pretty much an everyday basis. And we gotta know what's going on in that trade lane, what products are moving, what the ship market's doing. Is there a lot of ships there, which means the freight's gonna go down? Or is it kind of tight because the yard is open and there's lots of products going and all of a sudden the freight's going off. Your clients wanna call you. They're about to do a trade right now. You don't have time to go look up the information. You better know the information because those clients are counting on you to know that market. And so we gotta have a clue on all this stuff. So like US Gulf Far East, you know, there's styrene, there's vegetable oil, and there's BTX that moves. US Gulf to Mexico, there's a lot of parazoline, because in Mexico they make a lot of plastics. So remember, parazoline makes the plastic bottles. They go in and make the TVs and stuff like that, the plastic bottles. That's all going down into Mexico. Um, the Far East to the US Gulf, the US West Coast, US East Coast, there's benzene and there's caustic soda. You go down Brazil, Argentina to the U.S. Gulf, pretty much everywhere, ethanol out of Brazil. You guys have probably seen E85 and all the ethanol that's being moved. It's coming from Brazil. It's funny because we're actually moving ethanol to Brazil when the ships are passing, and that's a big political mess, uh, I would say. Uh, we're subsidizing that tremendously, and, you know, Brazil, their sugarcane ethanol is basically it takes it, yeah it's better it's uh it takes um eight units of energy for us to produce one unit of corn ethanol compared to what it takes to do the brazilian ethanol so we're eight times less efficient on our corn ethanol than they are with their brazil ethanol but the u.s basically puts uh, not sanctions but tariffs on the brazilian ethanol coming in because they wanted to build the ethanol here and the ethanol plants and help the Midwest and all that. And that's all great, but you're paying for it, you know, and it's not efficient. And ethanol may be cheaper, but if you look at the gas mileage, do your own test, you know, put ethanol in your tank and put gasoline in your tank. And I've done it, you know, I can fill it up with whatever, I drive a big old truck, right? It's what, 80 bucks or something to fill up the tank with gas, but I can do it every Sunday. I did it with ethanol, and yeah, it might cost me $70, but then I got to stop and get gas Wednesday night doing the same thing. So, anyways, that, sorry about my rant. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, U.S. Gulf to the Med, like vegetables, cyclohexane, ABA, Asian gas, Mediterranean to Far East, Mediterranean to India, Med Brazil, phenyl acetone. So all these products are moving all over the world. You don't learn that stuff overnight. You don't learn it in a year. You don't learn it in two years. It might take you four or five years to really fully understand all the different markets, all the dynamics of the market, and what's going on. So my typical day, <clears throat> shipping is a way of life. It's not a job. You want to be a ship broker? You want to be a trader? You want to be a commercial guy at the major oil companies or a ship mm -hmm. owning shop? You're on the phone. That phone better be turned on, and I better be able to call you at 2 o'clock in the morning. You better have the answers. You better not be drunk and you better be on it. If not, we don't have time for that kind of stuff, right? It's a way of life. I wake up at 5 a.m. On my commute to the office, 
I'm on the phone with London and Asia to find out what the market's doing. What happened in Asia today? What's going on in London? You know, it's, it's lunchtime in London. What's going on? What's, what's happened? I'm in the office by 6.15, 6.30. I'm going through the emails. Quite frankly, I roll over in bed in the morning and I check my Blackberry before I even get out of bed, you know? And so, if there's an emergent, you know, something that I see that needs prompt attention, I call. Um, but if not, I go through, go through what's going on operational, new quotes in the market. We send out daily info reports to our traders and to the people who need the information that I found out from Asia and London. Um, and I talked with our team. What did you hear? Because they're doing the same thing. So they picked up information that I didn't. We, knowledge is power. The more knowledge you have, the more you can beat your competition, right? And knowledge, in my opinion, information, in my opinion, is something that I don't know. If you tell me something that I know, it's not information. So information, to me, as a broker and for my team, is something that we don't know. My clients, it's stuff that they don't know. So I want to be ahead of our competition by giving them information. 9 a.m. to lunch, you know, I'm on the phone with the owners, getting more updates, talking to the charters, where are the ships, where are the opportunities, you got to know the market, what's moving here, stainless steel ship, you know, all this kind of dynamics, right? We're trying to get offers from owners, negotiate the terms, rates for the contract. Lunchtime, usually it's with clients, you're entertaining a lot, or it's my desk, you know, working cargoes. I'm more at my desk now than uh, I'm out with lunch with clients, but you know, the young guys are definitely out for lunch all the time. Two to five, we're finishing our recaps. We're trying to do reports, put market info together for clients, and uh, continue to find opportunities and hopefully negotiate more deals. We leave the office, and that's either for uh, home or happy hours, dinner with clients. I'm not really sure when I'm going to get home. Um, you know, especially as a young broker, young in the industry, you should be out probably every day. Trying to, find, trying to build relationships with these clients and getting them to trust you and you trust them. They're not giving you their $50 million cargo because you know they just met you. They're gonna trust you, they need to trust you, they need to know that you're available, they trust you, you hit it off somehow, I don't know, maybe they're a Steelers fan too, and that's cool, they're from Pittsburgh, or you know, whatever, and I have clients like that. And uh, find your niche and uh, find your hookup. After normal working hours for most, I'm also speaking with Asia and working my clients. So, uh, you know, tonight on my way home, I will be calling Korea and Shanghai and Singapore, and I'll be talking to these guys. Here's what I heard in the States. You know, this is what's going on. Usually I have a report for them for when they walk in. So it makes their jobs easier. They start to rely on me. If they don't give me cargoes or do something wrong, you know, that I don't like, then I stop giving them information and they look not as good inside of their company. It's kind of like, uh, you know. Give it to Yeah, well, in, in my MBA program, we call it, you know, the crack effect, right? <laughs> you give them a little, you know, give them a little bit of the, the start, right? And then they get addicted to that stuff, you pull that away, they need it back. So my information, I want it to be, the, yeah, whatever you call it, bait and change, or whatever. <laughs> you know, switch and change, you know. So that, that's what I want. I want information, things that they don't know. And then if I pull that away because they're not supporting me, they need it to make themselves look good. But it's got to be good. <clears throat> so what do you want to do is basically, uh, I think, good questions to ask yourselves. And there's not a right answer. There's, there's no, these answers are for you. You know, do you want to work nine to five and turn your cell phone off after work? Commercial shipping, brokering is probably not for you. Do you want to stay local in Houston? You know, that's fine, no problem. New York people, for whatever reason, we cannot pry people out of New York and Connecticut to save our lives. They just don't want to move. Houston's where it's at, right? They're losing opportunities because their jobs are being replaced in Houston. They just don't want to go. You know, um, there's opportunities all throughout the world, you know? Shipping is a world, global <clears throat> business. You want to take that opportunity, especially if you're young, maybe single, you know, go, go check some stuff out. You know, go live in Singapore, London, or Korea, or, you know, Hong Kong for two years, right? I mean, check it out. But if you don't want to do that, then you shouldn't target a firm that's going to make you travel. 
20 months out, you know, out of two years, right? Do you want a family, uh, yeah, do you want to travel the world? Are you willing to travel for an extended period of time? Do you want a family and kids? Hey, I have a family, I have a son. But in reality, um, <clears throat> if, you, if you're out of college and stuff like this and you want to go have this big family and you want to have, you know, five children in the next, you know, seven years, that's a, that's a fantastic goal, right? I mean, it's great. The reality is, if you're out of the office on a commercial side for three months out of a year, for the next three or four years having children, you are going to lose your book of business and you're going to lose your accounts because I'm going to come take them away. While you're away on maternity leave, I'm going to be hitting on your clients and I'm going to take those clients. Same with guys in, in, uh, in London, right? I mean, because guys in Norway as well, they get maternity leave. So, you know, these guys are going out and they take their three to six months off for, for maternity leave. If you want to be in a commercial role, or you want to be a broker, I'm going to be there to make sure that I know he's away and I'm going to start feeding you that information. And when you come back, my information's better, I've built my relationship, and I've taken your clients. You may get away with it once or twice, but you're not going to get away with it five, six times over a six, seven year period. So that's why I'm saying you want to think about those type of things on targeting what you want to do. Do you want to be the next CEO of a company? If that's the case, you're probably not going to come to Clarkson's because you, it's going to take you years to become the CEO. We're talking 20, 30 years, right? You want to go do that? Go target a consulting firm like uh, Deloitte or, uh, you know, the big one was the guy, I forget the name now, McKinsey. You know, the guy who did all the insider trading and just went to, went to prison, I guess, uh, Raj Roshan, I guess was his name. Um, but those type of companies, you get in there, they're going to work you to the bone, you know, for the first two, three years. You're going to be in that office doing reports until 4 o'clock in the morning. But you're going to be doing it for the top brass at the top companies in the world, and if you get noticed, they're going to bring you in to be the VP of that division or something, probably in the next three, four years. That's probably not going to happen in a shipping company. So if these are your visions, you probably should target different companies, these type of firms that you can get into these positions quicker. You know, do you want to sit in an office, like a terminal, a berth, or a ship? I mean, I sit behind a desk most of the day. Um, you know, it, it's different because we have a capital markets group and we have these accountants and we have these, uh, uh, they're analysts for stock and companies and these guys are like, they're really smart and they're all in their suit and tie and, you know, you walk into the kitchen and you're like, hey, how you doing? And fine. And they just kind of walk away, <laughs> you know. The brokers on the flip side are behind your desk, you're on the phone all day, you're trying to make it happen, there's a sense of urgency and there's a sense of energy on our side of the room we're on the analyst side of the room they're sitting on the desk and they're just doing analytical stuff and then at five o'clock they turn their cell phone off and they're not bothered so think about those type of things you know when i say you want to sit at a desk or you know you want to be at a terminal and you know put your hard hat on and go out to the ships and you know all that kind of stuff on a regular basis target a terminal go to a ship owner and you know you want to board the ships and you know see all these different things maybe there's an agency or something like that so these are the type of things that uh, you know you shouldn't look at do you mind long hours and late calls we talked about that and these type of questions can help answer what you want to target um hiring practices uh we, we don't really just look at a resume and hire whoever looks good in a suit you know we want diverse individuals who are motivated hard working and dedicated to our goals you know, you need to dress properly and professionally when interviewing or going to a, a job fair. I was at a job fair not too long ago, and I, I tell this story, this girl showed up. Well, it wasn't necessarily attractive or anything, but she was in a mini skirt, this white uh, button up, and she had cowboy boots on. And she was going around giving a resume out, and it was like, come on, really? You're at a career fair. I mean, you know, dress, come on. You know, I mean, that's not what you do. She got um, noticed. She did, but for all, the, yeah, for all the wrong reasons. She got noticed. She didn't get hired, right? Yeah. You're at a career, you, you want to get noticed and do that stuff, go to the club and do it. You know, you're at a career fair. It's different, right? You know, don't be really, 
real intimidated by the employers you're interviewing them just as much as we are interviewing you. I'll probably spend more time with you than I spend with my family. We kind of got to like each other, you know, and uh, it's, it's pretty important. Have a clue about the company, not just by looking at the website or quoting the stock price. You want to come work for Clarkson's or Oddfell or something, you know, Google and figure out what they're doing. Understand a little bit about what they're doing so you can go up and have an educated conversation with them about what they do. Have an idea of what you want to do and where you want to be in a few years. Again, you know, we had a girl come in to interview with, with us and, well, what do you want to do? Uh, you know, I don't know, I like working with my hands and I really like working outside and, you know, okay. Like in a terminal or a bar? No, kind of like in New York. And so my boss was like, you need to take up gardening, get out of my office, stop wasting your time. <laughs> you know? They have no time for this stuff, right? It, why did you come to our company to be a broker when you want to be a gardener? I mean, it, Practice your interview skills somewhere else. People don't have time for this. Um, you know, if you show up at our booth or, or anybody, have an idea what they do. Again, unfortunately, you have about 45 seconds to a minute to separate yourself from others at a career fair, and how will you do it? My son's a freshman at A&M, and I have to try to preach to him all the time, and he don't listen. And uh, I said, you know, we can pick these kids up pretty quickly when they come up at these job fairs and career fairs. You can tell right away. Yeah, whatever that. I said, I'm telling you, next career fair, come stand next to me, just stand next to me, and I'm going to show you how this works. Man, he, okay. So he stood there, and right away, he could see, he started separating these kids out like you wouldn't believe, and these were his classmates. Just by the way they showed up, and how they were handling themselves, kind of how they were dressed, how they asked the questions, and you could tell. I mean, and if you ever have that opportunity to be at a career fair or a booth, or, you know, even in an airport or something, watch the people, and you, you start to form right away, and unfortunately, those opinions go a long way, you know, so, um, how are you going to impress them, you know, because you have a 4.0 or on a football team, it doesn't really tell us a lot, you know, um, it means you can study hard or you can hit people hard, but what are you going to do for us moving forward, you know, how are you thinking quickly on your feet in order to make the right decisions to, to make the company money? Be polite, follow up, and emails are best. Um, you know, take the extra time to look through these emails. Um, you know, again, I pick on my son. He was trying to get into one of the universities. One of the professors asked him, uh, I need your senior class uh, transcripts, right? He sent them to her. And, you know, my son, he says, uh, uh, we'll talk about cultures with my, my wife's Korean and my son's obviously half Korean. And so they're very direct people. And, uh, you know, sometimes you, you ever see some of the Asians talk to each other, they almost look like they're yelling at each other, and I'm going to be, hey, how are you doing? That's a nice dress. But you think they're about to, like, kill each other, right? <laughs> well, my son's the same way. And uh, so, the, you know, please give me this information. And my son says, uh, he sends this thing, he says, um, as I told you before, I already sent it, here it is. Technically, he's right, but obviously he didn't get into that university. I mean, how about what, you know, you gave this to uh, Sandberg, uh, I've already sent this, but here it is again, best regards, Tyler. That, that's what I'm talking about. <laughs> so once hired, um, I'm an Aggie, Aggie Network, it's alive and well, I'm hurrying up. <laughs> um, use it, network in college, network with your friends. Other networks are King Point, Schuyler, Maine Maritime. Getting in is a huge accomplishment. Patience, it'll come. Um, you know, show up on time or early. There's no reason to be late. I tell people it's like New Year's Day. It's on the first. 7 a.m., 7 a.m. every single day. If you can't figure out how to make it to the office by 7 a.m., you shouldn't be working in our office. If that means wake up earlier, wake up earlier. If that means you're in the office 30 minutes early, so be it. You know, there's no excuse. Ask questions. You know, dress professionally. It's not an office. The office isn't a club or a bar. Ask questions. We're here to make you better. Geography, learn it. Look at some maps. Google Google Map and learn where the Suez Canal is. Learn where Brazil is and the, India and all these kind of places. The, the U.S. is not the only country in the world. It's a very global business, and I think that's really important. So the U.S. is we're a very small part of the global international commodity trading. So you got to kind of learn what's going on around the world. Know what's going on around you. You know, we've had some bad things happening in the U.S. lately. Have an idea, have an understanding, form a good opinion. It doesn't have to be right, just it has to be educated opinion, right? You know, people want to know about the election.
election and someone says, why did you vote for this guy? Well, I voted for Mayor Romney because I like his hair. Really, dude? You're the guy that would trust him with my millions of dollars worth of cargo? Not happening. Um, Facebook, you know, I'm going through this kind of stuff. Facebook, clean it up, restrict it. You know, all the young guys are definitely Facebooking you, checking it out, what's going on. If you're on there, pass the out to the party or you're picking on the, you know, homeless guy in the corner, or you're just doing some of the stupid stuff, we're going to see it. Our clients don't want to see it. They don't find it amusing either. Um, so, sorry I talked too much, but reviewing questions. Uh, I tell you what, if you don't mind, Scott, this is really excellent. How about if we let Maria talk and then they could ask both of you questions at the end of both of them. Would that be okay? Absolutely. Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much. Too, so. Especially about how to interview and how to get the job. <laughs>